welcome back. Hopefully that wasn't too much introductory, boring type stuff, but things you have to do in every course to set the table. And now the table is set and we're going to talk about the meat of the topic, what you signed up for. Our first segment is on the electric business, on making and delivering electricity, how the industry is organized and who's in charge, who tells us how we conduct our business because the electric business is highly, highly regulated and that is in the area of production of electricity and how we charge rates to our end user customers. So the story of the electric business we touched on in the introductory segment where we talked about how would society exist without the, the um, existence of electricity. In other words, we use it for many of our day-to-day -day activities and business, our personal lives, our, our leisure, all of that. And um, it's hard to picture society without electricity. In fact, you see uh, movies and shows from time to time that uh, talk about the electric grid being taken down and society is plunged into darkness and chaos and all that. I like to think that maybe that wouldn't happen, but uh, we certainly would struggle based on how we have set up our society right now. But the whole issue is how do we get electricity from beginning to end. So from production all the way to the end user. Well, we have a series of power plants that are, are fueled by uh, various means. And in our example here, we have a hydro plant, uh, but uh, some of the main types of uh, energy production are, are coal, nuclear, gas, and we'll, we'll touch on those in a few minutes um, and so on. But the main thing is that we produce electricity and then we take that high voltage electricity and we step it down in voltage and then we transmit it over long distances to what we call distribution utilities. So it be your local investor owned utility, electric co-op, municipal utility, and so on. We call those distribution utilities and the voltages, voltages again then step down so that eventually it can be used in our homes. So then it's distributed, hence distribution utility, to our, our homes, our schools, government, hospitals, um, donut factories, uh, manufacturing facilities, retail facilities, uh, all of those are the end users of electricity. So when you talk about how does electricity get to my house, the things to keep in mind are, are the power plants, the substations that are used, the transmission lines, and the distribution facilities that gets it to the service drop that gets it to the um, end user of that electricity. And that makes the electric utility industry very capital intensive. It relies on long-term debt to finance projects. So what happens is you build big projects, power plants, distribution facilities, transmission facilities, and so on. And generally those, those projects are financed with debt long-term debt that we pay to bondholders. And the idea is that we try to match the length of the debt to the length of the property that we placed into service. So if we have a power plan that lasts 40 years, we try to issue 40-year bonds so that we match that debt repayment to the life of the asset. And after 40 years, you replace it and with the next generation of uh, production facilities. So that capital intensity and matching it to rates is a big issue in the electric business. So again, the, the main types of electric in infrastructure financing are revenue bonds, customer rates to pay back those revenue bonds, infrastructure charges to businesses and that, that um, they pay us back for the facilities that we have to construct that are specifically for them. So like, for example, if you have a, a big foundry in your community, you know, that's a big user of electricity or from where I am uh, from in the uh, upper Midwest, we have a lot of cheese factories and dairies and things like that, big electric users um, and so on. So sometimes you charge them specifically for the uh, service that you provide to them in, in building that big infrastructure. Entities also use short-term loans. They use public-private partnerships, especially in the renewable energy area where a utility will uh, combine with a private entity that can get tax credits 
for building something like a wind farm where the utility just wants the uh, renewable energy off of that to meet a renewable portfolio standard. That's fairly common, more, uh, more common as we use more and more renewables. And then finally, grants. I mean, the federal go government from time to time has large grant programs to upgrade the grid, uh, upgrade distribution facilities and things like that. And so entities in the electric business will partake of those um, as well. So when we talk about the different types of electric delivery infrastructure, I mentioned power plants, uh, coal, nuclear, gas, are the main what we call baseload energy traditional type resources. But as we get more renewables, so, so wind, biomass, solar, and so on, those are becoming more common. Uh, hydro, I forgot to mention hydro, sorry hydro, um, when it comes to the more traditional types of um, power plant infrastructure. As I mentioned, uh, transmission facilities, those big towers that you see by the freeway or um, coming into your city, that transmit the high, um, high voltage electricity to the distribution facilities. And then the distribution facilities basically are your, your poles, your underground line, your overhead lines, um, your customer meters, uh, your service drops, and things like that. So they all combined, they're all intertwined. Uh, the ownership of them can be separate where you have separate uh, power production entities separate transmission entities in fact is fairly common we'll cover those in a few minutes and then distribution entities are your local co-ops investor owned utilities and municipal distribution uh, utilities as well so not that complicated but um, it all fits together it's a it's a nice it's kind of like a dance that's done between the the three or uh, entities uh, production transmission distribution to get it to you the end user. So I've been alluding to there's different types of electric providers. There are electric cooperatives which um, mainly began to be formed back in the 1930s as part of those uh, federal policies at the time to get electricity to rural customers because there was a real lack of electricity availability to rural customers. And so you find these um, electric cooperatives now that that span great expanses of rural territory. Their customers are spread out, but they also serve towns uh, in between. Uh, but they, there's, there's quite a few of them across the country, mainly in the West, although every state has some form of electric cooperatives. Then you have your investor-owned utilities. So there, those are your, your ComEds, your Alliant Energy, the, your Mid-American, Southern Cal Edison, uh, San Diego Gas and Electric, Pacific Gas and Electric, and everywhere in between, where they are funded by stockholders. So they have sold stock in the uh, in the stock market, and their funding uh, comes um, not all their funding, but uh, their their start came through uh, funding like that. So there's less of those, uh, but they are they tend to be the the higher dollar value. Uh, organizations of doing business. So they, they do, you know, tremendous billion dollar businesses. Although there's a billion dollar electric co-ops and there's a uh, billion dollar public power organizations as well. But these are the, the big the big bulk, heavily regulated at the state and the federal level. Then you have public power, which be would be your municipal utilities and things that we call joint, um, joint action agencies where they buy power and sell it to various municipalities and so on. So there's uh, well over, well, close to 3,000 public power entities throughout the United States. And then you have aggregators where in some states you have open access where you can buy electricity where you choose the provider. In these other uh, three instances, the co-ops, investor-owned, public powers in many states, if that's your provider, you have nowhere else to go. But in some states, uh, Texas, Illinois, others, you can choose your electric provider. And um, But in some states, uh, like Texas, Illinois, and so on, you can pick your own electric provider. You'll find uh, companies trying to sell you electricity. And what they do is use the wires of the local distribution utility, and they aggregate customers 
and they buy the power and they sell it to you and, and mark it up and but there's deals to be had and, and so on but we call those uh, aggregators so open access state have those those are the minority of states but um, gaining traction in some areas others not so much but they all look the same they're all in the same business meaning co-ops investor owned public power aggregators um, but when it comes to the oversight body those are different so most public power utilities and co-ops are regulated at the local level for rates by their boards or city councils. So when it comes to electric co-ops, these were again created by um, mainly by federal authority back in the 30s starting then, but uh, like I said, there's many of those around. And a lot of the funding not only came from the federal government, but it came from their customers. So we, have, we would have a rural territory, say in Nebraska, and they wanted to control their destiny when it came to electric power or build a new uh, p a power facility or a new power entity. So they funded up front the cost of that work and uh, building that infrastructure so that they could buy the electricity to serve them. So that's the uniqueness about electric cooperatives is that their customers really are part owners in, in the venture and they get paid back a return on their investment in some cases and things like that. But what that means is that the customer owners form the boards that oversee the cooperatives and govern them when it comes to rates and projects and things like that. Public power utilities, as it says here, uh, they have oversight boards, which can be specific, specifically for the utility or city councils. Um, in many cases, oversee their local distribution facilities because it's part of the city government. Um, a few states regulate the rates of, of municipal utilities. Those, there aren't very many. Florida, Wisconsin, there aren't too many of those. But the next category, investor-owned utilities, are regulated at the state level by utility commissions. And also, if they have transmission facilities, they're regulated at the federal level um, as well. So when we say regulated, you know, all utilities are regulated. And the, the, the definition of regulation in the utility business is that there's a governing body that says, here's what you can charge for your customer rates. So in every instance, there's some type of body that governs, that rules, can you raise rates or can't you? Now, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, or FERC, which, you know, you'll hear the word FERC a lot, and um, what FERC does is it regulates interstate electricity sales, so sales between states, wholesale electric rates, hydro licensing, and gas pricing. So each one of these areas is part of the utility business. So again, if you have transmission facilities, you're covering state to state to state, FERC will step in and say, here's what you can charge for rates. We call that a tariff. Here's what your tariffs can be and you have to get approval at the federal level, FERC, to um, charge the rates that you do for this transmission access, the interstate electricity sales. Now, along with that, the North American area is, is um, divided into what we call power markets. These various power markets control the transmission grid in their territory and they are used to control and facilitate the sale of electricity in their market. Now their main role is they provide order. You know, they maintain the powering of the electric grid in their market. You know, we're not going to get into the physics of electricity. I'm like the last person, well, maybe not the last person, the second last person that should be talking about the physics of electricity, but basically is this. You have to remain in balance for the entire grid to function. Um, at this point of time, it, it's late 2021, Maybe you recall a big ice storm in Texas last year in the winter of 21. So I think it was, um, you know, and the cold, uh, icy rain came down, formed ice, a bit of snow, things that don't happen in Texas very often. And what happened was, is that the grid in Texas became out of balance. You had a balanced demand and power production at the same time. If those two get out of balance and you can't bring them into balance, it's like, uh, tripping a circuit breaker in your house. 
and everything goes dark. Well, that's what happens there. That, 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 that's what happened there. And that rarely ever happens. We call that black start cap capabilities starting from darkness and, and it's a huge deal. But in any case, what these power markets do is they balance that flow nationwide of the electric grid, balance customer demand with the power production. They ramp it up and they ramp it down as needed. So more during the day, less at night, more on hot days and cold days, uh, less on uh, middle of the road temperature days and things like that. And so these regions like the California ISO, ISO stands for Independent System Operator. Uh, we have California ISO, Southwestern Power Pool, Mid-Continent or MISO in the middle there, PJM, New York, ISO New England, Ontario, Alberta, and ERCOT, the Electric Reliability Council of Texas. Again, they all work together, although Texas is a little separate um, when it comes to grid management. Don't mess with Texas. And in any case, they all work together to balance the load across markets throughout North America. So vital function. So when you talk about the grid, that is the grid. These are grid operators. When we talk about the, the uh, deficiencies that the United States and Canada have in their grid and we want to upgrade the grid, these are the entities that will build the facility, manage them, facilities, manage them, um, and so on. Now you have another organization when it comes to the uh, regulatory arena that we call the North American Electric Reliability Corporation or NERC. You notice the trend here, we got FERC, we got NERC and so on, get a little jazzy thing going. Uh, but in any case, NERC is charged with maintaining the reliability of the electric grid. Now they're a federal agency and they make the rules for reliability standards and they audit these power market organizations and make sure that they're doing what the rules say they should be doing. Rules have to do with um, cyber security, maintenance of facilities, things like that. Anything that would threaten the reliability of the grid is the oversight responsibility of NERC. And NERC finds uh, entities that don't meet the compliance requirements. They have a set of rules that you have to follow. They're pretty uh, stringent and straightforward. And then they come out, they audit your records. It's not like a financial audit. They, they audit the operational side of the business. And you can see that NERC also is divided into various regions in, in the United States and Canada, and uh, they govern that reliability. So you got the power markets and you got NERC over the top of the power markets. So that's basically the organization of the electric business. At a high level, that's really all, all you need to know. I think one more good takeaway from this segment is this, that we talk about the power industry of today and the power industry of the future. You might recall we talked about the different types of power production. Well, we have our, our traditional base load of hydro and, and fossil entities, nuclear, and so on. As, as we're moving to, to wind power, solar facilities, and things like that, we'll talk later about how battery storage is key to making that renewable um, renewable power effective and reliable and so on. Uh, we talk about our traditional high voltage transmission lines, uh, substations to serve customers and so on. A lot of that is not going away, but what we'll see in the um, power industry of the future are things like what we call microgrids, which are groups of customers that, that control their own generation, that have their own generation facilities, mainly renewable energy with uh, wind and um, uh, wind and solar and so on. And they don't necessarily need the traditional utility to provide them with power. Although if they have a lot of solar generation, they do because the sun does go down still at night. But in, in any case, you'll see more customer self-generation. We call those uh, DERs or distribution electric uh, resources. And you'll also see the coming and uh, more adoption of the electric car. Electric cars run on electricity. You need more electric facilities to serve those electric cars. You'll see a change in the business in that. 
So you see the industry is in a, in a big period of change. I won't talk more about trends in a later segment here of, of this class, but some people think this is going to happen very rapidly. Others, not so much. I'm more in the camp of not so much. Although, once you solve the battery storage issue, you're going to see a lot of change um, more quickly in the industry. The other thing that the cover before we get to our key takeaways is the lingo in the industry. Like, like any, in any industry, if you're new to the business and you come from another business line, you had your own lingo when you talked there as well. But um, I like to call this, how do you speak electric? And you see this whole screen of, of different terms and um, you know things that probably don't make a lot of sense to you, especially if you're new to the business, where you could have a conversation with anybody and use these terms and it would make sense and somebody from the outside would think you were speaking um, you know in a, a different type language and so on so for example you could say um, hey I have something to talk to you about uh, just a couple of things uh, we need to follow FERC and I know our, our NERC SIP is weak especially in reporting to CERC now when you're purchasing those RECs and PJM to meet our RPS don't forget the impact that'll have on our bond ratings with uh, Moody's, Fitch, and S&P. Now, that might sound like gibberish, and I didn't make it up, but you know what? Every one of those sentences makes sense, and together they all make sense in the same context. So we're going to talk about uh, speaking electric as we go through this a little bit, but I just wanted to give you a flavor about that. Like I said, kind of a jazzy tune. You got FERC and NERC and CERC and NUKES and so on, so you can... You know, you can make what you will of it, but if you hear folks talking like this around you, that's what they're saying. They're speaking electric. So our key takeaways for this segment here, before we take just a quick break. First off, electricity is vital to a functioning society and economic growth. The way we're set up as a society and our economic engines and so on, you cannot do it without electricity. I mean, it's been around for a long time. That sounds like a very trite point, but it's just something to keep in mind as you work in the electric business. And you work in the electric business, your job um, is to provide a vital function to society. Think of it that way. You're not just working in an electric utility or a co-op. You uh, provide that vital function to, the, to uh, society. Also, another takeaway is that the electric industry is highly regulated at the local, state, and national level. So think of FERC and NERC at the local level, then think of those as like board, oversight boards, city councils, and so on. Another key takeaway is that electric infrastructure is financed with long-term debt. We build long-term infrastructure, we issue long-term debt to pay for that infrastructure. And then, Customers pay for their current use of the electric system via their current electric rates. So we finance that long-term infrastructure, the big projects, and then customers pay us back through their rates so that we can pay the bondholders to pay for that infrastructure. Eventually we have to replace it and we go through the same cycle again. And the thing, you know, the main thing to take away here is that the electric industry is undergoing a rapid degree of change. So it used to be a really sleepy industry job for life, uh, things never change. This is, you know, going back to the, the 80s, the late 80s, and all of a sudden the 90s came and things started to move, things started to uh, pop with, uh, um, we talked about aggregators, those came on, on the uh, forefront in, in the 1990s, and then we realized that we didn't have enough um, transmission uh, capabilities to take care of the power that we needed to fund those, so we took a step back, then NERC was formed, you know, things like that. So there's a big change going on in the business. This is one business that will continue to change throughout your career. And finally, it's not hard to learn to speak electric. You just did, you're an expert. In our next segment, we're going to talk about what do people do in an electric co-op or a utility? There's lots of different jobs, lots of different skill sets. We'll cover those, we'll cover work for, uh, workforce management models, and things of that nature. So you get a flavor of the day-to-day -day activities and what people do to uh, run the business and serve your customers. 